Okay, so today we are finishing our journey through the book of Colossians, this letter to the church in Colossae. And hadn't it been a great few months through this letter? Uh, It's been just such a a gift uh, for me. And uh, this letter is four chapters. It's 95 verses, 1,979 words, packaged up as a present, as a gift from God to the church, to you, to you, to me, uh, to us collectively. And th- that really is what it's felt like to me. It's been a refreshing gift a convicting gift, a helpful gift, an encouraging gift. It's been a um, really wonderful walk through uh, this particular letter. And let me just uh, again remind you of the context of the letter. So if you'll remember Epaphras, who was the likely uh, pastor and planter of this church, he has come to Paul uh, to give Paul an update about how the church is doing, both the goods uh, happening in the church and the not so good happening in the church. And the not so good, the bad, is that a group of uh, new teachers had come into the church and they were not outright denying Jesus, uh, but these new teachers were trying to add to Jesus. They were looking at the church in Colossae and they were saying, "Um, if you really do want freedom and fullness, and I know you do, and if you want that freedom and fullness, here's how you're going to get it. It's going to be Jesus plus fill in the blank. And they had some particular things in their blank that they wanted in there, but it was Jesus plus something else. And and Paul is responding to that in this letter. This is the main theme of the letter. He's looking back at the church and saying, no, do not add anything to Jesus. The freedom and fullness you want is not found in Jesus plus something else. The freedom and fullness you want is found in Jesus alone. He is what you need. He's everything you need. So Paul spends four chapters lifting up the person and work of Jesus for us to see and experience and enjoy. He's just holding up the risen Jesus. And if you could just imagine reading through the letter, closing the Bible, and asking, what is the lingering sense Paul is wanting to leave you with as you finish this letter? Oh, what is that lingering sense? Uh, One way of saying it is Paul would want you to leave with with just a sense of Jesus really is over everything. He's above everything. He's better than everything. He would want to leave with that lingering sense of of Jesus is amazing. He, He is wonderful. He's the biggest and brightest thing in my life. And there is really nothing more important in your life than seeing Jesus like that. Better than everything, above everything, over everything. Uh, Listen to one commentator talk about this. He says, "What what you or what we think of Christ is everything. What you think of Christ, we collectively as a church think of Christ is everything. He goes on. If you believe that Christ, that Jesus is eternal without beginning and without end, if you believe that he's the creator of all things, if you believe that he's the sustainer of all things, the force which is presently holding the universe together, if you believe that he's the goal of all things, that all creation is moving toward him, if you believe this, then nothing much can go wrong with you. If you believe this, it puts a rock under your feet to live on, to plant your life upon. If you believe this, nothing much can go wrong with you. And then he finishes with this phrase. He says, we cannot think too highly of Christ. And what this letter is really meant to do is to help you think more highly of Jesus to hold up Jesus before you so that you can think big, beautiful thoughts of him. 
so that you can see him in his grandeur and majesty. That's what this letter is about. Now, we're to the last section. And uh, chapter four, verse seven. So if you've got a Bible, it would be really helpful to have that out and open on your lap where you can follow along. Uh, Right above verse seven in the ESV, which is the translation we typically preach out of, you're gonna find the words final greeting. And uh, and in a lot of ways, it's a great summary of what this section is. Paul is landing the plane uh, in this letter. And as he lands the plane, he wants to leave us with some particular pieces of encouragement. There's at least three in here that I want to just sort of set before you this morning. As he, as he wraps up this letter, three pieces of encouragement. Three things he wants to say to you to encourage you along the way. Here's the first. You'll find it in verse 17. The first piece of encouragement is Paul is looking at you and I, and he is saying, Brothers, sisters, fulfill your ministry. Fulfill your ministry. Look at verse 17. Paul says, and say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received from the Lord. See that you fulfill, that that you do, that you accomplish the ministry that you have received from the Lord. So now think about verse 17. It was aimed at a man living a couple of thousand years ago in a particular city, right? It was aimed at him, Archippus, but it was recorded It was written down so that we could receive it or read it a couple of thousand years later and then receive it from the Lord. So yes, it was addressed to him, but through him, it is addressed to you. See that you fulfill, and let me just focus on this phrase first, the ministry that you have received. See that you fulfill the ministry that you have received. Now, we don't know much about Archippus, And we have no way to know uh, the particulars of the ministry that he received from the Lord. And I think that's by design. It's it's by design so that the application could be very broad. So when you come across verse 17, we're supposed to read it and think something like this. Um, Yes, Archippus, be about the ministry that you've received. Accomplish it. Get get about doing it. And then we're supposed to think, and oh yeah, I, I should probably get about that too. I should probably figure out what that looks like, what that is, and I should get about the work of that ministry too. I should set my hand to these things too. I, just like Archippus, should be about these things that the Lord has given me. It is meant to be received, not just to Archippus, but to you personally. This is the Lord communicating this to you. And here's the reason that we need to receive it. If you are in Christ, if you're in Christ, you are in ministry. We just need to own that. If you're in Christ, you are in ministry. Now, the word ministry um, in our day and age has sort of a technical sense to it. Uh, it's, it's many times the way we refer to people who are vocationally in ministry. But that is not what I'm talking about here. Uh, this is the broad application of ministry. If you are in Christ, you are in ministry. The Lord has things designed for you to do. If you're in Christ, you are in ministry. The Bible affirms this in many places. Uh, One is Ephesians chapter two. Uh, If you think about the first nine verses of Ephesians two, it is um, showing us the saving work of God in a human life. Uh, It talks about how we're dead in our sin, but God makes our dead hearts alive. He resurrects our dead hearts. And when our hearts come alive, they do uh, this first. They cry out to God in faith. And Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter two, this is how you're saved. It's by grace through faith. It's not your own works. No, it is faith in the good work of Jesus. This is how we're rescued and brought into the family of God. Then you get to verse uh, 10 and Paul wants to confirm. He wants to make sure you know If you're in Christ, if you've been rescued, saved by God, you are also in ministry. Just consider um, Ephesians 2.10 for a moment. It is a spectacular verse. It is just packed with with, um, things that we need to hear about our life. Uh, Listen to what Paul says, Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship. You specifically designed by God. For we are his workmanship. Now listen to these phrases. Created in Christ Jesus for, that that has purpose attached to it. 
for, for this purpose, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let's just receive that from the Lord today, that, that you, yours workmanship designed by him, and you were created for good works. God put you on this planet for purposes. He designed some things for you. He, he set aside some good works for you, some things for you to do. And, and, and that phrase, good works, that he's created you for good works, that would be synonymous with the word ministry and how I'm using it. He's created you for good works, for ministry. He's made things for you to do. He, he's specifically designed you and these things and brought them together and, and given them to you. He's, he's put you on the planet for a purpose. He's created you for good works, which Paul says, God prepared beforehand. Now that is just so astonishing to think about that before you ever existed, before you were born, hear this, God thought of you. He thought of you. And, and then he determined the time and place of your birth. And then he set aside works, ministry, purposes for your life. He's prepared a particular ministry, a set of good works. And then he's entrusted that ministry, that, that set of good works to you that you should walk in them. That you should get about th th those things. Paul is reminding us both in Colossians 4 and Ephesians 2 that your life is packed with purpose. It may not feel that way to you all the time, but your life has been infused by God with meaning and, and purpose. If you are in Christ, you are in ministry. So uh, let's just pause for a moment and ask the question. What is the ministry that you have received from the Lord? And, and by the way, we, we don't take that ministry from the Lord. No, we don't choose even that ministry from the Lord. No, he chooses us for it, for, for this ministry, for these good works. What, what ministry have you received from the Lord? Uh, what is that? Now, when you think about the, the purposes of your life, like why, why has God made you? There is a general way to talk about it. And that general way is very helpful. You were made for the glory of God. There's nothing more true about your life than that. You were made for the glory of God, to enjoy the person of Jesus. You were made, maybe this is another way we could say it, to love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. You were made for that. It's a general way of talking about your life. And as good as that is, um, it's also right to affirm that in each season of your life, that general call to love God and love your neighbor to, to glorify God, to enjoy Jesus, that, that general call is going to take specific shape, a, a particular shape in your life. It's going to have particular application, a, a specific way that general call is going to play out. So I'll just give you examples of this from people across our church family. Uh, I bumped into a person, a, a mom, a couple of weeks ago, and we uh, were chatting in the lobby. And I mean, she's the jungle gym. She has like nine little kids, you know, all over her. I mean, she's just in that season of life with a lot of young kids. And uh, she looked at me in the middle of that conversation and just looked at her kids and said, this is, this is the ministry that the Lord's given me right now, is to shepherd and to evangelize and to help grow up uh, these little kiddos. And th that's a wonderful ministry. Th that's that general call coming down in a specific particular form. And the Lord's entrusted that ministry for her. It's not flashy. It's not gonna show up in the newspaper as some amazing work, but the Lord looks at that and calls that significant, amazing works and ministry that he's entrusted uh, to her. And uh, th there's all sorts of examples of this uh, across our church family. Uh, there's people in our church family who are leading groups, taking on the burdens and problems of other people, shepherding them, helping them uh, get connected and feel connected into a family, caring for them in that family, helping disciple and grow them up into maturity. It's a ministry that they've received from the Lord. Uh, there's people across our church family giving their life away in our student ministry, in our kids' ministry, making sure the good news of Jesus gets down to the next generation. 
there's, I'm just thinking of another family in our church that um, the Lord has just put a, a real burden in them to help struggling marriages. So they've just opened their heart and their home and their life to do whatever they can to help marriages that are struggling. It's an, just a ministry that the Lord's entrusted to them. So they plugged into our care ministry and just giving their life away to help in that sort of way. Uh, for some in the room, that's gonna be in your workplace. For others, that might be in your neighborhood. Uh, for others, that may be uh, toward eldership or even church planting someday. What is the ministry that you have received from the Lord? Maybe that's uh, for our students that's in your school. What is the ministry that you have received from the Lord? If you don't have an answer for that, I would just encourage you, get alone with the Lord and ask him to talk to you about that. The Lord loves to do that. He loves to clarify these things and to show us these things and to, and to lead us into the things that he would have for us. Get alone and, and ask him to clarify those things. If you're still struggling to find it, just ask the Lord to keep your eyes open to the needs around you. And then when you see a need, just start meeting needs around you. And it's amazing how the Lord begins to clarify uh, your giftings, your, your passion, your burdens as you start just meeting the needs of people around you. But what is the ministry that you have received? Whatever that ministry is, whatever those good works are, Paul is saying, see that you fulfill it. Accomplish it. Get about that work in your life. Jesus has infused your life with purpose, with ministry, with, with a particular set of good works. So, Paul is saying, give your life away to see those things come to fruition. Get about that work. Do those things. Uh, in, in, uh, in a way, I think part of what Paul is trying to rescue us all from is from our life drifting into triviality. Just spending our, our time and our energy and our effort on things that in the end do not matter. And Paul's saying, don't, don't let your life drift there. See the things the Lord has put in front of you and do those things. Spend your life doing that. Don't drift into trivial things that are not going to matter. Get about the, the things the Lord has called you to. Do, do those things. Give your time and your energy and, and attention to those things. Look again at verse 17. Maybe this is a way that you could read verse 17 just to help you with it. Maybe you could read it this way. Just imagine Paul saying, and say to, but, but let's just remove Archippus' name for a minute and put your name in there. And, and say to Rodney. Put, put your name in there. And, and say to your name. And, and receive this encouragement from Paul. See that you fulfill the ministry that you have received from the Lord. Fulfill your ministry. That's the first encouragement Paul wants to give us. But he has another one for us. Here's the second one. Fulfill your ministry and faithfully endure suffering. Faithfully endure suffering. Look at verse 18. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. And then look at these next three words. Remember my chains. Remember my chains. Now, let's first remember the context. Colossians is part of what's known as the prison epistles. Uh, and it's a group of letters that Paul is writing from prison. He is in prison writing these letters. And from prison, Paul is looking at this church and saying, remember my chains. Now, why would Paul say that? That could be a sermon in itself. I think there's a few reasons that we could give for that. But here's, here's the one I want to highlight for you today. Why would Paul look at the church and say, remember my chains? Well, Paul is writing to a group of Christians, a small group of Christians in a particular city. And uh, Christians did not have a favored place in this city. Uh, Christians were looked upon as freaks in this city. And this was how they were, at that time, most of the world, when they were thinking about Christians, they were the marginalized, weird group of people. They, they were the freaks. And, and Paul was looking at them and saying, remember my chains, because I think Paul is wanting them uh, to, to know and, and to recall and to make sure this is in front of them. He's trying to remind them that, listen, church in, in Colossae, 
Suffering is normative Christianity. It's not abnormal. For, for people to look at you and think, that guy's weird. For people to look at a Christian and think, uh, they're freaks. Uh, for people to look at Christians and think things like that, Paul is just saying, listen, I'm in prison writing this to you. Remember my change. This is normative. That's not abnormal when people treat you that way. It's not abnormal when people think about you that way. This is normative Christianity. Now, as much as the people in Colossae needed to hear that, I cannot think of a group of people who need to hear this more, that suffering is normative Christianity than a room full of American suburbanites. Us. I cannot think of a group of people who need to hear this more. Suffering is normative Christianity. Remember my chains. It's normal. It's not, it's just, it's run of the mill Christianity. Nothing weird is happening to you when you're suffering. It is just normative in the life of a follower of Jesus. And that suffering can come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Um, one we might just call ordinary suffering. Um, ordinary suffering, uh, you could think of it this way, it's just all the moments of self-denial that come in the path of following Jesus. Um, I have a friend that talks about self-denial this way. Self-denial is the moment when you have to take sides. You have to side against yourself and with Jesus. So just think about your own life. Um, you have desires for your life. You have things that you want this afternoon to look like, um, like a Sunday afternoon nap, right? You, you just, you have desires and wants for your life. And then Jesus has desires and wants for your life. And anytime your desires for your life run contrary to Jesus's desires for your life, self-denial is called for. You have to take sides. In that moment, you have to side against yourself and for Jesus, with Jesus. It's just normative Christianity. Like if that's not happening, if you don't feel this happening consistently in your life, it likely means you are not following Jesus. It's just normal. It's, we're always, we're waking up every day and just time and time again, we're having to decide against ourself and with Jesus. Against ourself and with Jesus. It's just the self-denial that is part and parcel with following the Lord. Jesus says, if you want to come and follow me, then here's what you have to do. You have to deny yourself and take up your cross. It's just part of following Jesus. Normative Christianity, ordinary suffering. But it's not always ordinary. Sometimes it's extraordinary suffering. You're walking with Jesus and cancer hits. You're walking with Jesus and all of a sudden chronic pain that just will not go away, away just erupts and stays in your life. You're walking with Jesus and out of nowhere, your heart and life is ripped open with the loss of a child. The loss of a spouse. The loss of a parent the loss of a dear friend. If we could jump inside of the lives of those in this room, it would take our breath away to know the stories of suffering in this room. The grief that people are walking through in this room, the heartache, Or you're walking with Jesus and persecution comes. Ridicule, mockery, prison comes. Uh, I was sitting with a friend of mine just a couple of weeks ago and just reminded of his story that he grew up in a Muslim context. And the moment he said yes to Jesus, that Jesus saved him and brought him into his family and he gives his life to Jesus was the moment his dad disowned him. Suffering is normative Christianity. Um, my, one of my favorite guys in church history is a guy named John Bunyan. He wrote The Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, John Bunyan wrote The Pilgrim's Progress in prison. He stayed in jail for 12 years, 12 years of his life, not getting to see his family, not getting to be a dad, 12 years of his life because he wouldn't agree to stop preaching Jesus. Or take Paul. Uh, Paul endured so much for Jesus' sake. 
In 2 Corinthians 11, we get a snippet of some of those sufferings. Paul says, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Just, I don't know how bad your life's been, but I doubt you have been stoned yet, right? Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from the Gentiles. Danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Just normative Christianity. In Acts 14, it's an amazing, it's an amazing moment in Paul's life. Paul is uh, preaching in a city, in Lystra, and uh, all of a sudden the crowd turns on him. They grab Paul, they drag him outside the city, and they stone him. And they stone him long enough and hard enough where they all think he's dead. They leave him for dead. They, they leave and go back into the city, leave a dead body behind. Paul's friends gather around him and pray for him. And Paul pops up. And the next day, that brother is preaching in another city. It's just amazing. And Paul is trying to say, remember my change. This is normative Christianity. Suffering is normative. It's not abnormal. Paul is wanting us to remember that persecution is more normative in the life of a Christian than applause. It's more normative. Suffering for Jesus' sake. This is why Paul says in 2 Timothy 3.12, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It's normative Christianity. This is why Peter, writing to a persecuted band of followers of Jesus, this is why he says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Peter's just saying, listen, it's not strange. This is normative. This should be expected in the life of a follower of Jesus. And if verses like this feel strange to you, if it does, if you're sitting here and you're like, well, I know it should be normal. This feels so weird. I, I don't know. It, it doesn't feel normal. If, if that's true of you, if this feels weird and abnormal to you, then you need to read Christian biography. You need to grow acquainted with some saints who have gone before you who have suffered so dearly in their walk with Jesus. Uh, maybe you could subs- uh, subscribe to the Voice of the Martyrs uh, newsletter and, and you can get a sense of today, 21st century, the amount of persecution and suffering happening to followers of Jesus. This is normative Christianity. And I think we need this reminder in this room. We as Christians in the American context, we are heading into a season where holding to Jesus is going to be harder and harder and harder. Uh, let's just take the issue of sexuality as, uh, for instance. As the church holds to the teachings of the scriptures, the teaching of Jesus about sexuality, refusing to bend to the sort of cultural pressure, as the church does that, more and more the culture is going to try to break the church, break you, cause you to suffer, make it costly for you to hold on to uh, Jesus and the teachings of, of the scriptures. That's coming. If, you, if you're holding uh, traditional kind of biblical sexual ethics, like what we have believed as Christians for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, if, if you hold that, it is going to be costly. I, I could tell you story after story in our church family uh, of moms and dads who have paid dearly to hold to Jesus in that area. I could tell you stories of friendships that have suffered because people are holding to Jesus in that area. People in their workplaces suffering because they're holding to Jesus in that area. It's just gonna be more and more costly to follow Jesus in places like this. And so Paul, in this moment, 
to finish this letter is, is doing everything he can to insert some steel into the spines of Christians, not just in Colossae, but in Midlothian, Texas, in his church, right, in Jesus' church right now. That's why he's saying, remember my chains. This is normative. When you suffer as you follow Jesus, it's, it's not something strange happening to you. It is something very normal happening to you. And listen, we pray that, that we're not riding from a prison someday, right? We, we pray that. We hope that we're not. But if that does come for us, if it comes for you, if it comes for me, uh, we can do what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5. We can rejoice and be glad, right? And, and why can we do that? Well, one, we can do that because we know our reward's going to be great in heaven, Jesus says. But here's the other reason we can do that. We know that we have good company in those prisons, right? Jesus says, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is normative Christianity. Paul's saying, faithfully endure suffering. Remember my chains. Now, when I put those together, fulfill your ministry, faithfully endure suffering, one of the questions it makes me ask is, I want to do that. I don't want to just do that for like a month of my life, a year of my life. I want to do that with the entirety of my life. However many breaths the Lord gives me, I want these things to be true. I want to spend my days fulfilling the, the work that the Lord has given me to do. Faithfully enduring some, I want that, but it makes me ask the question, how in the world am I going to be able to do that? What, what am I going to need to make it to the end faithful to Jesus? Now, Paul doesn't tell us everything we need in this passage, but he does show us one thing we're going to need. If you want to fulfill your ministry, faithfully endure suffering, here is one thing you're going to need. It's his third piece of encouragement. You need to follow Jesus with friends. To follow Jesus with friends. Christianity is a team sport. To make it. To make it to the end. You need friends. Listen to one commentator talk about Paul's life. Just commentating on this passage that we're looking at. He says, if one thing is clear, it's this. Following Jesus was costly for Paul. It cost him dearly to follow Jesus. Uh, there was nothing he'd rather do. He wanted to follow Jesus, but nothing he'd rather do, but it profoundly affected him physically, psychologically, and spiritually. Now listen to the last thing this guy says. He says, Paul needed his friends. He needed his friends. And I think it's safe to assume that if Paul needed friends, you need friends. You need friends. It doesn't matter if you're five in this room or 95. You need friends. The scriptures show us this over and over. Proverbs 18, 24. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Now let's think that proverb through for a moment. So here is ruin, and we don't, it doesn't specify what kind of ruin. It's every kind of ruin. It could be financial ruin, moral ruin, emotional ruin, marriage ruin. Whatever kind of ruin you want to put in there, th this is covering that type of disaster. And what protects us from ruin? Well, this proverb shows us what won't protect us. Many companions. You could translate that now. Um, many Facebook friends. Acquaintances. People that you kind of know. That will not protect you. But what will protect us from ruin? A faithful friend. A faithful friend. One who sticks closer than a brother. Or how about Ecclesiastes chapter 4? Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe. Like, I feel sorry for this guy, but, but woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. You need friends. Um, I love Lord of the Rings. Any Lord of the Rings fans in here? Okay, we've got a few Christians in the room. That's a good thing. It's good to know. Um, one of the reasons I love Lord of the Rings is because, uh, I, from my perspective, I think it has a very surprising hero. So think about the stories and the characters. Um, I love Gandalf. I'm a huge fan of Gandalf, but Gandalf is not the hero of the story. 
Um, I love Aragorn. Uh, he's an amazing character. I, I, he's awesome, but he's not the hero of the story. Um, I love Legolas. Um, there has never been one born of an elf who has ever shot a bow and arrow like that guy, right? I mean, it's amazing, but he's not the hero of the story. I love Frodo. He's an amazing hobbit, isn't he? But, but as, I mean, he's the one that like got the ring into the fire and say, all that, ha Frodo, but he is not the hero of the story. Do you know what the hero of the story is? Sam. He's the hero of the story. And you know why he's the hero of the story? He is a faithful friend. And every Frodo needs a Sam. Middle earth is ruined apart from Sam. A faithful friend. And that has been so true in my life. The last four years have been um, some of the toughest of my life. Uh, it started, that, that four-year span started with um, a lot of marriage conflict. Laura and I, for the first 15 years of our marriage, had virtually no conflict, uh, very little skirmishes, but no major battles. And then at about year 15, a war erupted that lasted about two years. And it was mainly around fostering. It was, it was such a painful season for Laura. It was such a painful season for me. It was just a hard, hard season. And when we look back over that two-year span, uh, we oftentimes just, we'll oftentimes look back and, and just rehearse and say to one another, where, where would we be apart from faithful friends? Would we have made it apart from faithful friends who were unwilling to see us go to ruin? Where would we have been? Um, we walk out of that season with a limp into uh, this thing. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's called a pandemic. And uh, straight into a pandemic that led uh, straight into just such a difficult season of racial strife, which led right into uh, the worst political season of my lifetime. Um, when, when I have like pastor friends uh, that say things like, I'm gonna quit, I can see why that is. It has been such a hard season navigating that, working through all of those things. And when I think about the last two years, I often just ask the question, where would I be? Would I have made it apart from faithful friends? Would I have made it? We all need friends. I agree with J.C. Ryle, the old Anglican uh, pastor, when he said this, this world is full of sorrow because it's full of sin. It's a dark place. This world is a lonely and disappointing place. But then he goes on to say this, the brightest sunbeam, one of God's most precious gifts that he gives to, to his sons and daughters, the brightest sunbeam in it is a friend. Because friendship halves our troubles and doubles our joy. Yes, you need Friends, follow Jesus with friends. Now, it's worth me clarifying and saying for some uh, in the room or some listening, uh, and this is probably in particular for like the 25 and 30 and down crowd, there is a tendency. This is one of the pitfalls you can get into with friendship. It's a distortion of friendship. Uh, but one pitfall is to overemphasize friendship all the way to the point of what we might call codependency. That is a temptation, it's a pitfall, but it's a distortion of friendship. So, so that is a potential pitfall, but there's a pitfall on the other side of it. And I think the other side is where most people in the room are. And it's not an overemphasis of friendship, it's an underemphasis of friendship. Most people in this room are living on a starvation diet of friends. When I ask people about friendship, I all, I, this is just in almost every situation, I, it's so uncommon to hear anything other than this, starvation diet. 
When I ask people who are 40, 50, and 60, hey, um, tell me about two or three great friendships you've developed over the last decade of your life. People cannot do it. They're just not cultivating and developing friendship. It's, it's a starvation diet of friendships. And on some level, I have empathy for this. Uh, when, when kids showed up in my life, it's like room for everything else vanished in that moment. Uh, so, so I can appreciate, uh, I read this tweet a couple of years ago, and I think it's hilarious and true, and I empathize with it. Uh, a guy said, nobody talks about Jesus's miracle of having 12 close friends in his 30s. I'm like, I I agree with that. We need to talk about that miracle more often. Ironically, in one month, that had a a half million likes. So obviously, it is resonating deeply in the lives of people because we are all, generally speaking, on a starvation diet of friends. But look at this text. Paul is not on a starvation diet of friends. Paul is rich in friendship. And he is inviting you into that wealth of friendship. Look at what Paul does in this text. He starts by platforming his friends. And by platforming, I just mean naming them. Paul names his friends. He he names eight of them in this text. He's just reeling them off. Here here are people that I'm doing life with. Here are those faithful brothers in my life that that are sticking so close to me, who have been with me uh, through thick and thin. Here they are, and he just starts naming them. Uh, One in verse 7, in verse 9, in verse 10, uh, a couple in verse 11, uh, 12, 14. He's just naming his friends friends. Whatever a loner is, Paul is the opposite. Paul is rich in friendship. He values friendship. Paul is spending time cultivating friendship. And he he spent time doing that because friendship was important to Paul. He saw the importance of friendship. So let me ask you the question. Are you rich in friends? Are you rich in friendship? If so, you should thank God for that this morning. You should should take a moment where you are and thank the Lord for blessing you in this season of your life with rich friendships. If not, you should this morning begin to pray for friends. Ask God to give you friends that stick closer than a brother, closer than a sister. Ask God for friends. And then after you ask God for friends, pursue friendship. And I want to burst this bubble for you. Most of us have a passive approach. Friends will just come to me. No, they're not. You are going to have to aggressively pursue friendship. Do you remember how you made friends when you were like five or six years old? Uh, You walked up to a person and you said... uh, Um, would you be my friend? And you know, as adults, um, we've outgrown the childlikeness of that. It's just weird enough that we refuse to do it. And I I just, if you're in your 30s, 40s, 50s, you're going to have to get over that and just embrace the weird and do it. Aggressively pursue friendship. If you're poor in friendship, pray and pursue these things. You need friends, the right friends. You need them in your life. Paul platforms his friends, and then I love what he does. He praises his friends. He platforms them, and he praises them. Look at verse 7. Paul says, okay, I, I want to tell you about one of my friends. His name is Tychicus. And, and let me tell you, when I think about this guy, th- this is what I think. And by the way, he's writing this letter to the Colossian church, uh, but Tychicus is the one who's going to deliver the letter. So yes, it's to them, but as much as it's to them, he's talking to Tychicus. Every one of his friends are overlooking uh, th- this moment, looking over at what Paul's writing, reading it along with Paul. So this is not just Paul talking about his friends. He's talking to them. And he said, I want to tell you about this guy. Uh, this guy right here, he is a beloved brother. Do you have any friends that you can talk about like that? A beloved sister. 
I, when, I, when I think about this person, my heart explodes with affection for them. Uh, this guy right here, he is a faithful minister and, follow, and fellow servant of Jesus. That's who he is. And then you get to verse 9, Onesimus. Paul says, let me tell you about this brother. This brother right here is a faithful and beloved brother. Do you have some friends that you think about that way? You feel that way about? If you do, now look at me right. If you do, you should say that to them. You should let them know that. It, it, Paul's not just platforming his friends. Here, here's who they are. No, he is publicly to their, like eyeball to eyeball saying, this is how I feel about you. When I think of you, this is what's happening inside of me. Then you go to verse 10. Aristarchus, he was with Paul in, in Ephesus when all hell broke loose. Uh, in, in Ephesus, Paul's preaching. Amazing things are happening and the crowd <laughs> turns against him. And they grab this guy, they grab him by the ankle and they drag him through the city. They throw him in prison with Paul. So Paul says, this guy right here, he is my fellow prisoner. That's who he is. This man has been down in the trenches of ministry with me. We have seen amazing things together. We have seen revival break out in cities together. And we have endured so much together for Jesus' sake. So much that we're in jail right now, in prison together. This man right here has been with me through thick and thin. I love this man. You get down to verse 12, Epaphras. Paul is looking at the Colossian church and he's talking about their pastor, their, their church planner. And Paul's looking at them and saying, let, let me tell you about Epaphras. I have been watching this guy for years. And, and here's what I always see about him. He is always struggling in prayer for you. Just pouring out his heart to God on your behalf for your sake. He is pouring out his heart to God so, so that you would stand mature before God, that you could stand fully assured of the will of God. That, that's what this man is doing. And, and I, when I think of Epaphras, Paul is saying, hey, let me tell you about him. This man has worked hard for you. He has laid down his life. He has suffered for your sake. This man right here is a beloved brother. Paul doesn't just platform his friends. He praises them. Years ago, I'll never forget reading this little line from um, a guy who was pastoring in the 60s and 70s. And he said uh, this, he said, unexpressed love was the great sin of that generation in the Christian church. Unexpressed love. And may that not be true of us, church family. May that not be true. May we express the love we have for our friends to them. So, so this week, th think about your friends. If you don't have enough, pray, pursue friendships. But those you do have, praise them. That could be a note this week. That could be an email this week. That could be a pick up the phone moment this week. That could be a take them out for coffee. Look them in the eyes and say to them what you feel about them. Because church, if we're going to make it to the end, fulfilling the ministry the Lord's entrusted to us, faithfully enduring suffering. We're gonna need this gift from Jesus, friends. We're gonna need to follow Jesus with friends. Why don't you pray with me? I wanna give you just a moment to allow the Spirit of God to press down the things that would be most helpful and to wipe away the things that wouldn't be. Why don't you just ask the Lord there where you are to speak to you? To bring home to your heart the one or two or three things that you need to consider deeply this morning. Fulfill your ministry. Paul doesn't want you to waste your life. He wants you to spend it doing the very things the Lord has set in front of you. 
faithfully endure suffering. Follow Jesus with friends, the right friends. So Father, would you press these things down into us today? Would you speak to us? Would you address us? Father, would you give us responsive hearts? Ready to bend to the things that you would want? Oh God, would you do that? And I'm so grateful today that we get to end by taking communion. In a lot of ways, communion is doing the very thing that the letter of Colossians was designed to do. Um, It's designed to lift our chins up so that we can gaze upon the dying love of Jesus. That's what communion is for. And let me remind you of um, who communion is for. It's for those in relationship with Jesus. So if, if this morning you have not trusted Jesus as your Savior, if you've not surrendered to him, if you have not turned from your sin and hurled your life upon him, holding up your life to God and saying, I'm trusting in the person and work of Jesus, rescue me. That's your first work this morning. So before you take communion, take Jesus this morning. Run to Christ this morning. There where you are in the best way you know how, offer your life to him. But it's also for those who are in right relationship with Jesus. So is there any sin that you need to repent of? Anything you need to confess to the Lord or to a brother or sister this morning? You need to do that before you take communion today. And then thirdly, it's for rejoicing. For for rejoicing. I love the last couple of of words that Paul leaves us with. The last phrase is grace be with you. And here's the reason communion is a moment of rejoicing. As we are gazing upon the dying love of Jesus, it is a reminder that grace will never leave us. It will always be with us. There's never going to be a day that you wake up where grace will not greet you in the morning. It's going to stay with you forever because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So this is how communion works. Uh, You should have gotten a cup on the way in. If you didn't, there's going to be some up here. And so we're going to give you some time uh, to spend with the Lord. These guys are going to play. We're going to start singing here in a moment. And as you're ready, there where you are in your seat, uh, you can peel back the layers, um, have the bread, and have the juice there where you are. So Father, would you meet us? Father, would you meet us? And it's in the great name of Jesus that we ask it. Amen.